So, first and foremost, I say, uh, in my work, I have gotten in a lot of trouble uh, for saying things that people don't like. Welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> <You're right home. laughs> and I wanted to start there because um, when I think about y'all, y'all are my heroes. And I think I'm tepid. I'm lukewarm <laughs> in comparison to y'all. So anytime somebody is saying I'm saying something crazy, <laughs> I feel righteous in saying it because I don't think I'm saying anything crazy at all. I know people who are going harder and who've been working harder um, than I have. And so I think of y'all as my inspiration, um, as my superheroes, and um, as a daughter of Dallas, um, I'm like eternally grateful to everything that y'all have done. And when I had the privilege to read your bios, <laughs> it was really humbling just to think about all of the work and dedication and time that you have put in um, and the ways in which you've given your life. And so many of us don't even know it. Um, so I just want to say personally thank you. Um, as a child of this city, um, as a beneficiary of Dallas ISD, just I want to start there and say thank you. Thank you. Um, I am going to read very abbreviated bios okay. because <laughs> the other thing was when I read y'all's bios, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> there's so much. Like, and it wasn't even filler words. It was literally, I have been awarded a thousand awards. <laughs> I've had a million firsts. Um, and so I'm reading an abbreviated bio, but I think it's important that we give honor to the work that you've done. First, I'll read um, our moderator, Miss Classy Nance Jamo. Classy Nance is a Dallas-based artist and photographer exploring untold histories of space, place, and people of the region. Classy is a third generation Dallas native and the daughter of organizers, historians, and artists who, who, who have deep knowledge of Dallas black history. Through her work with the Ball Ballad of Jane Elkins, a play about the life of the first documented black woman lynched in Dallas, um, to teaching at the South Dallas Cultural Center, she has been a vocal advocate of telling the history of Dallas, Texas. She currently serves with the Office of Cultural Affairs as a cultural arts partner, doing workshops in oral history and photojournalism, allowing for community history to be told, protected, and transformed as an act of reconciliation. That is Miss Classy Nance right there. <laughs> Mama May Beck. Uh, May Beck is the entrepreneurial mind. I put this, you didn't write this. <laughs> <laughs> May Beck is the entrepreneurial mind behind the Othello Beck Jr. Gallery, a role that she has played since 1969 after they married. While doing that, she also ran her own company, so she was doing this at the same time, the Sainter Avenue Learning Center for 17 years. A graduate of Dallas Baptist University, she has also worked with Texas, Texas Instruments, the Health Education and Welfare Office of Child Development, the Department of Justice Community Relations Service, and the Department of Justice for U.S. Parole Commission. The late Othello Beck was a revolutionary artist who started his art career by painting African-American culture, children, and families during the 1960s Civil Rights Movement, when you never saw positive images of African-Americans depicted in school books, magazines, newspapers, billboards, TV, etc. It was a very revolutionary thing to do at the time, something that we really take for granted today. Um, she has continued to sell his art since his passing in 2004. Silent plug, y'all need to go ahead over to that gallery and check out the art. Um, and that is Miss Maybeck. <laughs> Melvin Trailer is a former teacher, principal, and central office administrator. He has received numerous awards including the Legends and Education Award and the African American Educators Hall of Fame. He has served nearly 40 years in Dallas ISD, during which time he has engineered several firsts. He implemented the first Saturday school in the district. He partnered with a community college to provide the first concurrent courses for senior students in high school. He installed the only 90-minute block schedule in the district. 
Um, he organized a committee of students, teachers, parents, and clergy and led community walks to each of his ninth grade students' homes to solicit input from parents on what they wanted the school to provide. Um, when he was tasked to turn around a school where there was only 10% of his ninth graders who were on grade level, catch this, he removed remedial courses and replaced them with on level and high academic courses. I will say that again. <laughs> he removed remedial courses and replaced them with on level and high academic courses. Catch that. He created extensive staff development for teachers and staff. His school provided evening classes for parents that included ESL and computer literacy. When he retired from Dallas SD, he did not stop working. Um, he went on to develop social services programs for residents and apartments homes. He developed and implemented the life enrichment and academic program that focused on homework, tutoring, arts and crafts, com computer technology, field trip snacks, summer learning, and meals for children in apartments located in Dallas, Austin, Houston, San Antonio, Brownsville, Denton, and Arlington, Texas. He now runs a 501c3 nonprofit called Abundance of Life, where he aims to continue that programming in as many apartment complexes as possible. Um, that is Mr. Melvin. <laughs> Division 4, 
and she's active in many education and civic organizations, serving on several boards, um, and has been the recipient of numerous awards. When I tell y'all, when I read that paragraph of awards, <laughs> and this is like not all of them, this is just a list of some, <laughs> it was a long list. Um, yeah. <laughs> she's the mother of Brian and the grandmother of Jordan, um, who she says is with a twinkle in her eye. Um, her best response when asked what she is doing in her retirement, what I want, <laughs> when I want, <laughs> if I want. <laughs> her commitment to service, to community and children, and serving is legendary. So this yeah, is very true. our family. <laughs> Teaching Trust, we thank you. Um, and we also thank everybody up here. We thank you, Jamie, for putting it together. And so I'll start there. So my first question, I'm sorry. I'm going to stop saying I'm sorry. Okay, I lost my page. Okay, so my first question is, um, I'm going to open it up to, our bios were heavy hitting, right? But what is it that if we had, if we stopped here today, we stopped at 7 o'clock, 7.15. What is it that we would tell the, the group of leaders in here, the group of people in here, that are something that they could take with them immediately into the community, something that they could form um, and m make it go forward, um, but not make it, and make it go forward uh, together? What would that kind of be? And uh, can I start with you, Mufai? Of course. Yes. And I probably will need a mic. I have a sinus infection mm -hmm. and it's starting to go into vertigo, so mm -hmm. we, have a di we have a dizzy broad before you today. <laughs> Um, firstly, I just want to thank Jamie for this opportunity and for the invitation, and Classy, whom I have known before she even came into this world. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of history together uh, as members of St. Luke Community United Methodist Church, where uh, she and her parents and I were very, very good friends, and I remember when, uh, when, when your mama announced that you were on your way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that ages me more than her. Um, to answer your question about what are some immediate takeaways, um, you know, we're living in a, in a time that is very challenging. 
especially challenging for the have-nots. Mm -hmm. uh, for there are those who are abroad who want to make sure the have-nots have even less. Mm -hmm. uh, if you looked at the, the budget that was put forth uh, by the current resident of the White House, um, it's taken away Medicare, taken away monies from education, just all of the safety nets. And um, as I said, I'm a member of St. Luke Community United Methodist Church, and I consider myself a Christian woman first. And I, my Bible tells me is when you do it for the least of these, that you have done a God's will. Uh, so my takeaway uh, for you all is we, we got to stop being silent. That's the first thing. Yes. Because uh, silence gives assent. Yes. And when something is wrong, you got to say it. My dad said years ago, somebody stomps on your feet and uh, you don't say anything. You assume that you know, it was a mistake. But when they do it the second time, right. it's shame on you if you don't say something. Right. And I think we're in the shame on us mode right now. Mm. Uh, we have voice and we have to give voice and advocacy for those who need it the most. Let me circle back around to whom I think need it the most, it is the children. Mm -hmm. um, there is a saying that you can tell the quality of a nation by how it treats its young and its old. And we are failing on both counts. Uh, when you look at where our elderly are, I was, uh, I went to see Charlie Wilson last Friday. <laughs> That's one of those, what I want. And, <laughs> and uh, on our way back, we stopped at a um, uh, Chick-fil-A feed, and there was this elderly woman cleaning the tables. And when I say elderly, I mean she could barely get around. And some of my friends say, I wonder why she's working. I said, because she has to supplement her income. And you will find that in a lot of fast food places now you see elderly folks working because they can get free food and a little something to supplement uh, their income. So she was a shining example of how we are not doing well by our elderly. Uh, I often visit uh, schools now when I'm invited. I've stayed away for, I'm six years into retirement, so the first four years I stayed away because uh, folks think you come and trying to tell them what to do even if they need to be told what to do. <laughs> uh, so I was visiting a couple of campuses in the last couple of months, and um, the light that I used to see in the eyes of children are not there for many of the children. And we are responsible for whether they have light in their eyes or not. We really are. Um, my challenge to all of us, including Shirley Ice and Newsom, is that we have to convene policymakers mm -hmm. and hold, begin to hold them accountable for what's not happening in the schools. Uh, we have to visit the schools. You don't know what's going on until you get in there. And the lawn may be well manicured outside, but it's whether the classrooms are well taken care of. Uh, my final word, and I'm gonna pass it on, uh, is that we got to care enough. You know how Mark Carter was saying, you care enough to send, your very, send the very best? Mm -hmm. Well, we are the very best, and we need to be sent mm -hmm. into these centers where there is need, raise our voices, give our resources, and resources is time and talent mm -hmm. and treasure, all three. Because um, someday we're all gonna be judged, mm -hmm. and you gotta decide whether you're gonna be the wheat or the chaff. Thank you all. Um, well, first and foremost, I would like to say it is an honor to be here with Ms. Newsom. Um, I have admired her for many years, and she doesn't know it, but she really made me a better teacher. Mm -hmm. oh, Every time, that we had to present to you whatever our um, plans were for that school mm -hmm. that year. I was always nervous, but yeah. I knew you were gonna always make sure that I was on my game, that I was on yeah. point. Yeah. And for that, I thank you for yeah. that. Thank I you. thank you for that. Thank you for um, I started off by saying I was speaking to my pastor earlier. Um, I've always lived when people tell you 
to that you're supposed to have a vested interest in your community. Well, I have a vested interest in my community. I've always lived five minutes from my school. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. So, and, and, and that was intentional. Mm-hmm. Um, I, my kids know that I care. Um, it's all about testing them. Mm-hmm. And when you say there's no light in the children's eyes anymore, because school is a job now. Mm-hmm. A lot of our kids come to us because they need to get away from the real world because their real world is not happy. Um, they're dealing with a lot of things that children aren't supposed to deal with. Parents being deported, you know, lights being cut off, uh, ducking bullets, you know, wondering am I gonna wake up? Uh, am I gonna have food when I go home, you know? So those aren't things that, that kids are supposed to worry about. Um, we have a lot of people now that morality is not there. There's no respect for the elderly anymore. and. Grandmothers are 45, 47, you know. Um, I tell my, my parents that I have to teach them the things they didn't learn through their children mm-hmm. because they never grew up. Mm-hmm. So I have to go by way of my children to teach the grown-ups mm-hmm. how to hold forks or dress appropriately. I know you all have seen kids that come to school with a coat on and shorts, you know, and they're freezing. You know, kids that aren't getting sleep that are going to bed at 12 and 1 o'clock because mom has two or three jobs, dad has two or three jobs, and I got to take care of my siblings. Mm-hmm. There's no respect anymore. There was a time where if it was a female or a child, they would, wouldn't want to hurt them. Mm-hmm. But now no one cares about that. Mm-hmm. Our children come to school, and a lot of our kids come to us academically, they're ready, mm-hmm. they're prepared, mm-hmm. but they don't have the nurturing. They don't feel like anyone cares whether I'm here or not. Um, they don't get to laugh. I've had students that, I had one kid in particular that didn't laugh the whole year. Mm-hmm. And a kid that doesn't smile, there's something wrong with that. When a kid doesn't it's smile, it, it's a lot wrong with that. So for me, I've learned over the years that I had to go that extra mile. When I went to school, teachers were an, ex- an extension of family. Mm-hmm. You know, my my thing was that if I, if God would be ashamed that I did it, I didn't do it. Mm-hmm. If my mama would be ashamed that I did it, I didn't do it. Mm-hmm. If my teacher knew that I did it, I didn't do it. Because those were the people that mattered the most to me. Mm-hmm. Because those were the people that I knew cared whether I was the best kid or the worst kid. And when they say, send us your best, every child is the best. Yes. And when they say every child can learn, every child can learn. But the thing is, they're worried about who's measuring and what are you using to measure me with. And I tell my kids, sweetie, what does your yardstick say? If you're doing it the right way, then do what you do best. As long as you're happy and you're successful, you're not robbing anybody, you're not getting illegally, Ms. Calico is proud of you. So I would say, as a teacher, and if you're going out there in the world today, you're going to have to love a little bit beyond your limit. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to work a whole lot beyond your limit. You're going to have to expect a whole lot more from yourself, not from the kids, mm-hmm. from yourself. Because they come to you expecting everything from you. Mm-hmm. You're the doctor. You're my best friend. You're my uncle. You're my brother. You're my sister. You're my aunt. You're even mom and dad. I tell my parents at the beginning of every school year, we have joint custody. (coughs) I have eight hours, you have the rest of the day. But see, they're uh, they're alert and alive when they're with me. Mm. They're asleep when they're with you. Mm. (laughs) So I get the best part of them. Now I've become a personal advocate for special education students. And as as Jamie told you, my son is autistic. And I've become a very vocal advocate Mm -hmm. for that because there are a lot of teachers a lot of you all go in that classroom ready to get there with those kids and I'm ready to do this and oh they're going to be so precious and so wonderful and I'm just going to teach them this and they come at you a whole different way screaming or or running or or cursing or being loud you think get them out of here but that's a child Mm -hmm. and at the end of the day that's still a child and you're supposed to expect this just as much from that child that has a neural problem or a learning disability or emotional disability 
as much as you would expect from your child. Because if it was your child, you would move heaven and earth. You would work until you bled. You would go without eating. You would work 15, 24 hours a day as a teacher without pay raises, without benefits and the, and the insurance benefits next year because that's your child and you would do that. So I say that when you leave here and you step in that classroom with those children and when you look at every face, See your child and do what you would do for your child. Mm -hmm. That's all they want. They want you to love them as much as you love your child because that's what they really want to be. They want to be, oh, Miss Newsom is my mommy. She's my aunt. It makes their day to claim you. Mm -hmm. So guess what? Claim them. I don't know why you let Shirley <laughs> go before me. <laughs> so for that reason, I'm going to yield to Miss Beck here, <laughs> and I'll come back later. <laughs> Good, evening. Good evening. First, I have to say thanks to the principal, the teacher, and the first lady, yeah. Miss Newsom of DISD. To me, years and years ago, there was Shirley Newsom, there was Yvonne Ewell, and there was Kathleen Gillen. And briefly, I'll say, for some reason, they kept Arthello in DISD, and he wasn't even a teacher. Uh, during those years of desegregation, Arthello, because of people like them and teachers, were in DISD showing his artwork mm -hmm. because we didn't, as I saw it, there was no black children in the books, mm -hmm. the literature, mm -hmm. so black images too. And yeah. there were no black images. so. Mm -hmm. Somehow he got into, the, they invited him into, he was all over the city, private schools as well as public schools, showing his artwork. And he would leave out of each class. He, he was not a public speaker, but he would always say, I don't get up in front of an audience to speak, but I will go to the classroom and talk to the children about my art, and I will paint a child in each classroom, and I will explain to the children, one child that I, I'm going to be about an hour or so, he'd be in a classroom when uh, in a school, and or either they would put him in the auditorium on stage or somewhere in the hallway where the children could pass <coughs> by and see his work. He'd always take samples of his artwork, but he would paint one child and explain to the children what he was doing and that child would go home with the artwork or the teacher would keep it in the class for a period of time. So that's briefly, that, that's why I'm sitting here because of Arthello. Uh, and I do thank Ms. Newsom and all the educators that used my husband as an example of, to represent our culture. Okay, my, what I'm more concerned about this day and time is our black boys African-American boys, and I would hope that they wouldn't be used as a scapegoat mm. for crime. Mm. Mm. Uh, as we've seen in the media here recently, it seems that when an African-American boy, especially, I, s I see a lot of politics in it in this city, creates a crime that goes on and on and on, uh, then they want to create laws and stuff. We don't want our boys criminalized because, mm -hmm. yeah, everybody creates murders and fights mm -hmm. and this and that. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, none of our African American boys, and a lot of people may not like what I'm saying, but it's the truth. None of our African American boys have created massive crimes. Mm -hmm. 
they have not gone into the schools and killed numbers of people. They have not been on a balcony somewhere in a hotel killing numbers of people. This is across our country. They have not gone into churches killing numbers of people, etc. So we don't want them over criminalized. We want if they're committing such a small amount of crimes, even in Chicago when they talk about black on black crimes, if there is criminal activity going on with them, then there's something else wrong too. Are they getting the benefits of the education? When I was growing up, and I'm old, when I was growing up, they had in our schools wood shop, home economics, cooking, auto, auto, yeah, auto mechanics, <laughs> that type of thing, where kids could get out of the school, some kind of little trades, where they could get out of the school once they graduated, they could have some kind of trade to begin with. And I think it, they, if our education system had some kind of training for these young people, girls and boys in particular, since it seems to be an issue with them now, that they would come out with some kind of, some kind of, uh, They'd know they'd have something to do. They'd have some some kind of trade that they could start out with. So that's uh, one thing that to me is is really important. We need to do something to help our children and not criminalize them with a lot of laws, a lot of law in the community, a lot of police driving up and down the street where they're afraid to walk, if, you know, and surely they're going to run if, if the police try to catch them because they're scared. Mm -hmm. So we don't want our African-American boys criminalized. Mm -hmm. We want that money that could go on trying to rule them by certain laws, specific laws in their neighborhood, that money could go on educating them some kind of way. I think that's about all I have to say. <laughs> Still our eyes. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. And I just want to say thanks to those of you who are responsible for bringing us together this evening to talk about education because Education is the key. And uh, I would say to you, as you approach your careers in education, especially in teaching, the first question I used to ask uh, teachers, prospective teachers, candidates who's going to be uh, English, math, science, whatever teacher position they want to be in, the first question I would ask them is that, uh, are you looking for a job? And uh, sometimes they would say, well, I'm looking for a teaching position. And usually when they say I'm looking for a teaching position, I go on and prod them a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But those who say that I'm looking for a job, I will tell them to go down the streets to Burger King, right. <laughs> uh, to McDonald's somewhere, because that's where the jobs are. If you want to be a teacher, and you have come to the right place. Because first of all, you have to be committed. Uh, commitment is the key. And you have to ask God to give you the directions in terms of where you want to go uh, as being a teacher. Because it ent entails so many things. You have to be the mom, the dad, the uncle, the aunt, the cousin, the judge, the jury. You have to be everything. So if you're not committed to being the whole person uh, for a child, then it's not good for you to be in that position mm -hmm. or in that uh, career. Uh, I will tell my teachers a lot of times at meetings, especially at the beginning of school, is that uh, and I always had this saying that uh, every morning in Africa, 
a gazelle gets out. And that gazelle knows that if he has to outrun the fastest lion, or he's going to be killed and consumed, eaten. Likewise, every morning in Africa, a lion gets up. The lion also, she has to outrun the fastest gazelle, otherwise she and her cubs will starve to death. So it doesn't matter whether you're a lion or a gazelle. Every morning when you get up, you better be running. So as teachers, every morning you better be running because every day is going to be different. And so you have to be uh, ready for the changes, all the challenges that gonna, you're going to be faced with. And uh, the way you do that, one of the ways you do it, is have a relationship with God. Uh, my teachers, Ms. Newsom, used to ask me a lot of times, uh, what, how, you seem so cool. There's a fight going on. You're just so cool. You don't seem to be ex excited about it. <laughs> well, I've already prayed about that. You know, God has already handled that for me. And so I'm going to deal with it based upon what the policy is and what needs to be done with the child and his or her parents. Speaking of parents, then of course there are three things when I became principal of O.M. Roberts Elementary School, my first year as a principal. I wrote a paper after about six months there at the school uh, saying that uh, there are three institutions that are vitally important in the success of child's life. And it's in this order. It's the home, the church, and the school. And those three institutions working together creates a successful human being. Many times we have children now, especially nowadays, who are homeless. And so you have to be that home for that child. Uh, for her, his, him or her, because they have all kinds of issues that are going through that you can't even imagine, not knowing where they're going to lay their heads at night or if they're going to have food to eat. So you have to be that bridge to help them to understand what that's going, how to handle that, how to go along about it. So it's important then, if you're going to be a teacher or anything in the school environment, you have to be committed. Mm -hmm. Commit yourself, just know that this is what I want to do. Because it's not easy, it's not something that uh, you get up in the morning and, and, and you know it's gonna have a, a easy day from the standpoint of uh, not doing what you need to do. I remember as a teacher myself, I enjoyed going to school every morning. I'd get up singing and on my way to school, I'd be singing down in the car, and I'd get up and get into the classroom, and I was just happy because I knew that when the bell sounded, I was going to have 25 or 30 children coming in eager to learn. And it was up to me then to bridge that learning gap, whatever it might have been, to help them to get to be better children, both from the standpoint of <coughs> academics behavior, and uh, socialization, the whole works. So I think that uh, uh, where we are now, uh, as a matter of fact, I attended a meeting this morning, at the ISD uh, attendance committee meeting, and the, the concern was that there are children who are being absent from school and uh, they're not coming to school. And so I'm thinking where, you know, you send out these notices, you send out, the, they say they send out flyers, they send out uh, these messages on um, these smartphones, whatever you, you guys got. You know, I, don't, I don't know what that is. <laughs> the social media, whatever that is. You know, I, I still, I'm old school. And this is the kind of phone that I have. All right? So if I was, if I was in as a principal of school, I wouldn't be sending anything home on phone. <laughs> I drive up in my car to the house and sit down with mom and dad, or mom or dad and their child, and sit down and talk to them about the responsibilities that are engaged. Mm -hmm. And when we did community walks, that's what we did. That was our, our, our main goal, was to go out and meet the children's parents 
and talk to them about uh, everybody's responsibilities. I give them what my responsibilities were as a, as a principal. The teachers would give their responsibility, and the parents would talk about, here's my responsibility. This is what I have to do. And then as a child, you know, you, you're not working. You don't have to work, so your responsibility will be in school every day. And uh, your, your big responsibility is to pass that course the best grade you possibly can. So everybody have to be, you have to define everyone's responsibility and be accountable for it, hold them accountable for that. So the main thing then is sit down with people, eyeball to eyeball. You know, it's all right, phone calls is fine. You know, I'm not knocking that at all. But if you really want to get to know and be engaged, sit down with people eyeball to eyeball so they can see you, see your eyes, you can see their eyes, because the eyes tell you a whole lot. You can't see the eyes over the phone. So if you sit down with them personally, the children, I would always, any time a child had to come to my office for whatever reason, whether it be behavior or academics or whatever the case may be, I'd make them look at me in the eyes, <coughs> and uh, I'd look at them in the eyes, so that we both would be on the same page in terms of where we're going. So it's important then that we communicate uh, effectively. And effective communication is sitting down, uh, engaging with each other, and developing a relationship so that everybody will be on the same page in helping our children to get to where they need to be. There are two things that are very important for this year. And I know you know already what they are, other than what you're already doing. Number one is the voting, whatever, Whatever you do, just go vote. And everybody you see, you encourage them to go vote. There's power in voting. Just like there's power in prayer, there's power in voting. The other uh, thing that's important for this year is the census. Do the census. You know, we talk about, you know, there, were t there was a time in the African American uh, life that we were counted as three-fifths. Three-fifths of a person. We weren't whole, but when, when, the, when they finally uh, compromised the three-fifths uh, voting, I mean, the three-fifths uh, uh, issue, I think it was December 6, 1865, when that compromise, when that was compromised. And it was signed January 31st, 1865, because we didn't get it until 19th of June in Texas uh, that we were free. But my point is, we have to, if we're going to be counted, we have to be counted. We are whole. We're not three-fifths. We are whole. And so we have to be counted. Fill out the census form, go vote, so that your children, your grandchildren, your great-great-grandchildren, Everybody, all children of all faiths will be able to uh, have a good time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Jenny has the next question. Uh, okay, so over the past couple of days, we've been thinking about what it means to be community conscious, centering community in ways that allow us to be leaders who can actually create equity in education. Um, what that means for a lot of folks in this room is that they have to break some rules and push against the grain um, in ways that may disrupt, cause problems, bring uh, shame to their reputations. Um, and so I want to ask a question about the fact that y'all have done a lot of firsts. That means y'all have to break a lot of rules. Um, Things that we have privileges to do now and that we celebrate today, y'all have actually opened the door for. And I'm curious about the journey to do those things, um, the challenges that y'all have faced um, in creating some of these first, um, and advice that you would give to people who have to do it now, um, given the numbers of pushback that they may face. Um, you know, first you have to decide what is that line that you are unwilling to cross? Mm -hmm. What is your line in the sand? 
can't. And everybody has to decide what that line is for themselves uh, because everybody is going to be pushed to that line. Mm -hmm. And the minute that you cross over it is when you have compromised yourself for life. Uh, my grandmother, uh, may she rest in peace, was a very strong woman, and, and she used to say all the time, uh, when you come to that line, you plant your feet solid mm -hmm. and stand your ground. Mm -hmm. I was very blessed, uh, as I said, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, my grandmother was in Petersburg, Virginia, to have had parents who encouraged me to say what was on my mind and say it respectfully but you have a voice and you have a mind and you speak up. I was very active in the civil rights movement, I'm getting out of your question, uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, part of the, 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 the sit-in movements was arrested. Uh, went to a Western Junior High School, which was a predominantly white school. I was one of the first ones they sent over there. They desegregated the schools one way. And I was arrested and my picture ended up, just happened to end up on the front page of the paper. It is in uh, the history books of, Louis of Kentucky right now. And when I got to school, my biology teacher, Mr. Larsgaard, uh, I went to go over my seat and he said, no, your seat is over there in the corner. She's a jailbird and I will not let her contaminate the rest of you. I took my little self to that corner seat because I remember my grandmother said, plant your feet, because I was proud of what I had done. Mm -hmm. um, and in those days, when they gave us our grades, you would walk from teacher to teacher with your report card. And he gave me an F minus with a zero, with a circle. That was for misconduct. Mm -hmm. And I remember this, well, I, I started laughing. He said, what's wrong with you? I said, all my A's counter this, and I will pass your class, so you can give me the F, that F the next six weeks, too. <laughs> Uh, so when you say, you know, sometimes you just got to speak truth to power, yeah. your truth. And as long as you are speaking your truth, as you know it and as God has given it to you, you'll be all right. Uh, they laugh about me being direct. I've gotten so much trouble in the DISC over the years. <laughs> 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 Dr. Lois Harrison Jones, who was the deputy superintendent for schools, uh, came to a little affair somebody was giving me and she spoke and she said the thing about Shirley is she's always going to tell you what she's going to do and I appreciate that and she said the fact that she tells you after she's already done it <laughs> <laughs> is another issue <laughs> but sometimes if you know what you're doing is right and it's right for children keep the children first and what's right for children first there isn't a power on earth that can move you. I was with this district 40 years, and people wonder, how did she last for 40 years? No, seriously. And I know it's because I, uh, first, I'm God's child. Right. And no weapon formed against you. Amen. If you're doing what is right. I was remembering when uh, Mates that talked about, and, and, and Melvin talked about commitment. Uh, Yvonne Yule, Yule used to say, take this with you. Commitment being be caring, committed and competent. You gotta know your stuff. Yeah. That's how I got away with a whole lot, because I knew my <laughs> stuff. <laughs> and knew the superintendent's stuff better than he knew it. <laughs> so be caring, committed, and competent. Mm -hmm. May talked about criminalizing these kids. Don't believe the hype that's out there about the children. Mm -hmm. Let every child come to you as a clean slate. Mm -hmm. And you define together what that child is going to be because the future of these children are in your hands. Mm -hmm. And how you talk to them, how you look at them, what you believe is possible for them is what they will believe is possible mm -hmm. for themselves. Right. I was principal of Harry Stone Middle School, which was the lowest performing school in the Dallas Independent School District when I got it. Mm -hmm. So there by, <coughs> excuse me, the Veterans <coughs> Hospital had the highest poverty rate of any school in Dallas at the time. And they gave me that school. Uh, I think they thought they were going to try and run me off by giving me that school. <laughs> um, two years later, we were on the front page of the, then the Dallas Times Herald as the highest performing middle school in the state of Texas from where, from where we started to where we ended up. <laughs> and I just want to tell you quickly how we did that. Melvin talked about walking your neighborhood. We used to do monthly walks on Saturdays in the neighborhood where our kids were. 
whole faculty. Now, they would give me one, two Saturdays. Actually, they gave me two Saturdays a month because they also tutored on Saturdays. Um, and the parents, because we went to them, loved us. We could do no wrong. <laughs> Whatever their children told them, they kind of verified. Ms. Newsom is that so? so I, I talk to the teachers. Get to know your parents. They are your best friends and your best supporters. Yes. Then get to know your children. Get to know them by name. When I was in Louisville, Kentucky at Manley Junior High School, our first parent conference night, I had 100% of my parents to come out. Mr. Marvin, my principal, came up and said, we got to go. I said, but I haven't finished talking to all the parents yet. <laughs> Next day, he asked me, come in. He said, how did you get all those parents there? I said, I told the children that they had to make sure their parents came. And you know my kids, they do what I tell them to do. <laughs> <laughs> and it's about caring and loving your kids. Now, I was a hard teacher. I mean, hard, because I wanted to pull the very best out of them. Kids know when you are dumbing down to them, yes. Yes. when you have no expectations for them. Have the highest and pull it. Just pull it's in them. And you got to say to them, it's in you. Let me pull it out of you. We're going to pull it out of you together. Because hmm. you can be your best self, better than even you think you can be. That's what caring and commitment, and then you got to know your stuff. Don't go in there half step. Do the research, do the reading. You'll be all right. Look at me 40 years later. <laughs> Now I'm beginning to see <clears throat> why I, I admire Ms. Newsom so much. We have so much in common. Yeah. Um, first and foremost, and this is, I, I, I like to say, I'm one of those people, I say what you're thinking. People think it, but they won't say it because, mm -hmm. oh, that's, that's not politically correct. Well, I'm sorry, it's just the truth is the truth. Mm -hmm. I yeah. teach with the, the, the facet that I want to be able to look myself in the mirror every night. Mm -hmm. And if I can look myself eye to eye in the mirror, then I did good. Mm -hmm. Uh, I learned from my pastor that the Lord will give you beauty for ashes. Yeah. You just got to be patient. Mm -hmm. And God's time is not like ours. It, we might think it took 15, 20 years, but in the Lord, it's like five seconds. So we got to learn to be patient. Uh, I'd say commitment. When he said commitment, I see so many teachers coming now. You all trying to get rid of them student loans. Mm -hmm. You all are yep. coming to at-risk schools, yep. Yep. and you're doing damage to our children. Yep. Because all you want to <laughs> do is pay off your student loans. So you know, if you do two years at an at-risk school, my loan's forgiven, I'm gonna move on over there because they got better kids over there. Mm. I say, when you see a child, and they'll tell you, and like I said, I'm an advocate for special ed and behavior units to kids now, more so than I've ever been. They'll tell you, quit. Well, they can't do this. How do you know until you try? Mm. Exactly. When you say the paperwork says he can only do this and this and this, that paperwork doesn't know that kid. Mm. And that paperwork is old. Right. That's a different kid every day. That kid leaves you, give them a clean slate every day because yeah. it's a child. Mm -hmm. You're the adult. You set the tone. Mm -hmm. You have to have a high expectation. Mm -hmm. But with my children, I've done, I've, forgive me for this, I've hidden <laughs> out cars when parents couldn't make car notes. I've let them hide cars in my car, in my driveway, so they could make the payments so they couldn't lose their car. We aren't taking this part out. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll edit it. We'll edit it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But it's okay because I can retire, so it's okay. <laughs> right. But um, I tell my parents that when I help you, I help my child. Mm -hmm. When I educate you, I educate my child. Mm -hmm. And it's all about my child. So if you come to my classroom and you say this, and they always say this new math they got now, it's mm -hmm. not new math just new words. Mm. It's the same math, mm. but the parents are afraid. Mm -hmm. So I tell my parents, come to my class. I've had parents come into my house on Saturday. The whole deal is, you just gotta bring snacks. We gotta go like these, you gotta bring snacks. Right. <laughs> you know, Come to my house and I'll teach you. Because a lot of parents, they never finish school. Mm -hmm. They don't want to tell you that, they're embarrassed. Right. And a lot of kids, my kids tell me, parents are surprised, oh, I thought you lived in Plano. Oh, I thought you lived in Little Elm. Because most of their children, most of their teachers don't live where they live. Because mm -hmm. they're thinking less of themselves because I don't live in Little Elm. I live in the Grove. They call our kids what? Yeah. Greedy Grove. Greedy Grove. Greedy Grove. Greedy Grove. Well, you know why they're greedy? Because there's a lot of things they want that they've been told they can't have already. Mm -hmm. 
And it's not that you can't have it. You can have whatever you want. You got to let them know. You can have whatever you want if you work for it. Mm -hmm. But you can't just say it in its empty words. Mm -hmm. Kids read people better than adults do. Amen. And they are like, like I tell Tammy earlier, they're like sharks with blood in the water. Mm -hmm. Once they see that weakness of yours, oh, yeah. no, they over. will. It's over for you. <laughs> And a lot of you all go in that classroom with the interpretation that, hey, I want pre-K. I want kinder. I tell people those are the worst kids in the building because you never know what they're going to do. <laughs> Pre-K, they sit and they tell you all their parents' business. <laughs> you know all the stories. You know everything that's what's said in the house. But you have to sit with a straight face, look at that parent like you don't know what happened last night. <laughs> I mean, that's hard to do. <laughs> but I'm saying you have to be committed. You have to go against the grain. When I remember when I first moved, and I think I've always been blessed as a teacher because I've always had favor, and I've always wondered why. When I left Teich, most people have to go and interview to go to another <laughs> campus. I never had to interview. The people came to me. The ED sent one to the job, bought my paperwork. They took it downtown. They signed me up, sent me to the school. When I walked in, the principal immediately took a dislike to me and told one of the TAs to watch me everywhere I went to write down everything that I did. And the TA felt bad. I said, don't feel bad, do what she told you to do. <laughs> do your job, don't lose your job because of me, because I'm gonna do mine. <laughs> My kids were failing. I had over two thirds of the kids that failed because they didn't know. I didn't blame the teacher before. That's not, that, it's not that teacher's fault. But I gotta do my job because it's my responsibility now. And I did my job. <laughs> yeah, I got in trouble. Like I said, I say things other people think. But I don't ever have you wondering what I think. Mm -hmm. And if I say it, it's because I've thought it through. Because I don't like apologizing to people. Mm -hmm. So I think through what I'm going to say to you. So when you come at me, and say, well, aren't you going to apologize? No, I meant what I said. Mm -hmm. I didn't raise my voice. I didn't curse you. I didn't scream. I just told you a fact about yourself. And you might not be willing to listen to it. I'm a firm believer, and I reflect on my life every day when I go home. Is there a better way I could have did this? Is there another way I could do that? What is that count? Okay, what I need to do for that kid? I bought uniforms. I bought food. I bought backpacks. I've given rides to school. I've given rides home from school. I've kept kids. I've gone to wakes. I've gone to funerals. I've had momentary custody of a child because the child didn't want to go home. And the parents said, okay, they want to be with you. I trust you. I tell people, I do what I would want done for my child every day. Mm -hmm. My child sits in a classroom every day with that other teacher. I want that teacher doing what I'm doing for th these other children. Exactly. Do for my child. Right. Yeah. So when he says being committed, you really have to be committed. This has to be something you really want to do. Mm -hmm. Not that I need to do, I want. Mm -hmm. Because if I want it, I'm gonna do the best at it. Mm -hmm. Because it's what I want, not what I have to have, not what I got to have. They'll never ever pay you what you're worth. Hmm. You will never ever get paid what you're worth for what you do. Because you give 110% of yourself. If you are a real teacher, you will always give more than you get. So when I say you have to be committed, I say that when I go home, I can look in that mirror and say that every child I treated Fairly. Every child I treat like I would do for my kid. I loved them. I taught them. I cared for them. I was there for them. Whether they had an academic need, a social need, a personal need, an emotional need, whatever need they had, they brought to me that day. And even if they didn't tell me about it, I can watch and see down the hallway, and I wear glasses because I can't see far away. <laughs> but I can see one of my kids walking a certain way, and I know who it is by the way they're walking. I can hear a voice. I don't even have to see them looking. I can hear that voice. I know who that is. I know what you say. I tell my kids, I see what I want to see. I hear what I want to hear. If it's important, I'm going to stop. Whatever I'm doing, whether it's a pre-K or a fifth grader, I'm going to stop. Whatever I'm doing, if it's important enough to that child, it's important to me. Because if they know that you truly care about them outside of that test score, they will do everything in the world to be successful just for you. Well, I don't know if I can follow you all. <laughs> you said a whole lot, which is so true and so 
right in this society today. So I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the community, community conscience. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, well, it's all community. Mm -hmm. We have to look at what's going on in our community with our families. We have to watch the media. Mm -hmm. The media can do a lot of damage, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to the low-income communities. Mm -hmm. They can tag us in a negative way. Mm -hmm. We have to look at what's going on in our city. What kind of rules are they making to a that will affect negatively against the low-income communities. Those communities, we, we, uh, the teachers, educators have talked about what's happening to our children. There are rules in the community that affect our children negatively and can be some of the reasons that our children are suffering some of the reasons our parents are suffering. When we talk about crime in the community, they talk about the crime, but how can you leaders, uh, you ladies, your group serve the community that they're talking about, the negative things, the rules that they're putting on us? Uh, how they want to control us in our communities, low-income communities, with the profiling of our children. That's a, a way that they define what's happening in the low-income areas. Mm -hmm. So watch the rules the guidelines, the laws that they're creating to affect us and come up with ways if you have to write in to them, if you have to go to the city council meeting, go to the school board meetings and let them know how you feel. You write your guidelines, let, put your input into your school board member. Uh, to your city council person so that we can have rules that will help create a more positive way of living in our community for our children. And we definitely don't want our, our kids to be profiled mm -hmm. in any way. That's just a, a summary. I could go on and on, but I'm going to pass it. Thank you. Um, I would say if you're going to be whatever career, especially if you're going to be a teacher, have a vision mm -hmm. in terms of what kind of teacher I'm going to be. And once you do that, then be committed to do it. Uh, you have to make decisions sometimes that kind of rub other people the wrong way. And, uh, but if you're committed to doing what you're doing, what you want to do, you have your vision intact, then just do it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I remember a school I first went to. Uh, there were children enrolled in correlated language arts and remedial math, and these that particular school had outstanding athletes. And you can't get into college if you're taking cor uh, correlated language arts or remedial math. So I tore up the schedule. First day of school, you know, and no the kids didn't. I said to the counselor, I need to place in calculus, that was six children. I need 15 children in calculus. In correlated language arts, everybody's going to be taking English 1. You know, all ninth graders are going to be taking English 1. Get them out of those courses. So they had to tear up the, the schedule. 
And I knew that <clears throat> my boss was going to come out and he'd see all the kids not in, in regular classes and he's going to be on me. But I knew that <coughs> if I was going to have a good school in terms of where these children are going to need to be, then they have to be in the right kind of courses, mm -hmm. uh, challenging courses. Mm -hmm. And so you have to put your foot down, as Ms. Newsom said, at some times. And uh, just stand your ground and say, this is how it's going to be because I have a vision of where I want this school to be, and I can't do it if we're going to be complacent. So create yourself a vision, be committed, and ask God to help you. Thank you so much. Our time here has gone so quick that we are going to wrap up. We are going to be, not all the way wrap up, we're going to wrap up the questions. But real quick, I wanted to give you what I thought were kept coming up. So what kept coming up for me that our panel said was commitment. I know that this is a group that works with educators, <laughs> correct? They And you work with decision makers and policy makers. Voting kept coming up, right? And policy and lobbying. Testing kept coming up. Those tests all have to do with lobbying. They go down to Austin, who gets the biggest bid. Okay, we think this will be best. You know, then we're going to implement TOPS. We're going to implement STAR. We're going to, you know, all the TEAPs, all of these lovely things. So commitment. Testing is killing education. Testing is killing education. Testing is killing education. We're preparing kids for tests and not A hundred percent. I have a personal story. I have four children, 10 to 2. Three are in the DISD school system. I have the brightest children, like all of my people, like every parent think they do. Testing is killing education. So we do have those teachers, I also work in the school system, who they know that, but they get demonized, they get unsupported, they, their contracts don't get renewed because they're not teaching for the test. So commitment, being able to lobby, uh, whether that is politically or um, from your standpoint, being able to lobby with the educators, being able to let them see that they are supported in that line in the sand. I also heard vision over and over again, and going back to being systematic, not demonizing people of color, not demonizing people based on what propaganda says. So mm -hmm. one very important thing that kept coming up too was Mr. Beck being in the school system. All these images we see, can anybody finish the sentence in 1492? That's propaganda. <laughs> now, whether you believe it, it's true or not, that's propaganda. Propaganda is anything that's been taught over and over again and mass perpetuated. So it's our job to take the propaganda back. So that's what we were doing and still are doing in the system with seeing our own images because it matters that you see yourself Right. And you see yourself succeeding. So when Miss Isom Newsom said, Classy, you ain't supposed to be here, and I had an attitude. <laughs> but I knew somebody cared for me. I knew somebody saw me, and I knew somebody cared enough continuously to keep checking me. And then I took that on to my peers. And I took that, and those peers took it on to their peers. So it's a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. So the impact that you're having with the educators is not just a one on one effect, it's not just me and Jamie talking. It, it goes on to who Jamie's talking to. It goes on to who your principals are talking to. I'm at Tom C. Gooch. My principal has a teaching trust, green and white thing. That tells me she's been to the training. That tells me they're now getting to know what culturally responsive education is. We love these keywords and we've been doing it, but for propaganda's sake, we have to name it, right? And propaganda's not always negative, so I don't want you to take away that we're saying that these are negative things. We're saying commit. We're saying be intentional about your propaganda, uh, and we're saying coexist with the community because we are community. Everybody, the people who elect people into office are community. The census is all about the community. So we are saying coexist, be together, learn, keep learning, and take those actionable steps. And now we're here for questions. <laughs> you all think that we don't value your opinion. That's not true. So we got to have at least one question or statement in here. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Dominique. Um, nice to meet all of you and thank you for spending the evening, uh, part of your evening with us. Um, my question is from your perspective, um, what 
have to be sure that uh, that person is the kind of person that needs to be where he or she needs to be. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have, you don't want window dressing. Well, your leader needs to be just as committed or more committed than you are in terms of where you're going. So I think that uh, uh, if I was looking up to someone in a position, I wouldn't want to be like that person. I, I want to be like Shirley. Of course, I never could be able to carry out the way, way she did. But <laughs> <laughs> I want to be. She was the kind of person that um, just exemplified pureness and goodness mm -hmm. for that profession. And so I look up to that. Yes, um, what I would look, thank you. What I would look for and have looked for is people who are principled. Mm, yes. Because people without principles will go anywhere and do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so firstly, is somebody who is principled. That's what I want to see in leadership at the district level, at the school level, and in the classroom. Uh, the second thing, and I said it earlier, is folks who care. And kid, I mean, kids are like little dogs. They can sniff you out in a New York man. I used to say to uh, my teachers when I was a principal, I don't think I'm going to do your evaluation this year. I think I'm going to let the kids do it. <laughs> because the kids know you better than anybody, and they have this seventh sense about them that can just, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they have a crap detector. Mm -hmm. I mean, they really do. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing is that you care enough about the profession at the district level, at the school level, at the classroom level, that you are going to stay constantly engaged in preparation to be your, to be your better self. Because when we are our best selves, then we pull out the best in the kids and everybody else. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's what I would look for and would hope for and would hope for each of you and for myself. I'm still becoming mm -hmm. an educator. I really am. Mm -hmm. I read more than I send folks uh, on my email list. I send them articles all the time. I said, you need to read this. Mm -hmm. It has moments for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, along with what they would like to see, but personally, because I am still in the system right now, I'm still a part of the big machine, I would like to see all this testing go away. Mm -hmm. yeah. We, and, and when she says that the spark is gonna, it's gone. They are drained. We test every week. Every week. There's a test for something. I asked my principal the other day, when do I get to teach? Mm -hmm. Because all I'm doing is I'm, raise, I'm raising robots. Mm -hmm. I'm teaching you how to take a test. Mm -hmm. You ask them anything out of A, B, C, D, they can't help you. You know, uh, run on sentences, spelling words, punctuation, because that's not scored on the writing test. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you can't have a decent conversation because every few words is like and like and like and like, I'm so sick of hearing kids tell me, and it's like, and it's like, can you tell me a sentence why it's like? So when I say what I would like to see, I would like to see a principal, like you said principal, I'd like to see a principal that would back me mm. because they know, I know what I'm doing, I know what's best for my kids. Mm. I would like to see a district fight to say, we're giving too many tests to these children. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're grading our children, not by their consistency as far as what they've done all year, mm -hmm. but what they can do in one day. Mm -hmm. And that's not fair to our children. So I would like to see the tests go away. I would like to see real leaders stand up to Austin, to the United States, and say, it's not always about the tests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just real quick one. Just real quick one. <laughs> Test results aren't really for kids, because yeah. kids don't get anything out of tests. It's so that adults can say that I did my job and I need to keep my job and I need to get that bonus. Right. Mm -hmm. And the day that we decide that we're going to focus on the needs of kids mm -hmm. is the day testing. You know, I, went, I, I, I took the test in elementary school. I couldn't be more tell you now what I did on that test than the man in the moon. Right. Because they use the test to make a difference in how they were going to educate us. Right. Mm -hmm. 
It wasn't to measure me. It was a measurement tool for the institution so it could do better by me. And the day that we understand that testing has nothing to do good for kids is the day that we will stop it. I think I'm a right to uh, Royce and them tonight about that. <laughs> I've long, long time said testing is not something, and certainly you, you want to be sure your children are grasping what you're teaching, but the focus on teaching a test, that's not teaching, in my opinion. So the way we have to do that is everybody, it's political, it's a political thing. So if it's political, then that means that we have to get out here and vote for the persons who will represent us the teachers and education in the way that needs to be uh, carried on. Mm -hmm. As long as we sit back and put these people in, in office that uh, does, who do not advocate for us mm -hmm. in terms of teaching, it's going to continue to be because it's political and it's all about money and politics. Mm -hmm. So we have to go to the polls. We have to put people into office and, and uh, be sure that uh, those persons will begin to uh, legislate for better teaching positions. It, it starts with voting. Right. You know, we can't do it at all by ourselves. It takes everybody. Mm -hmm. So go yeah. vote. I think that, well, I forgot to, to mention this. It was on my mind a little while ago when I was talking, and then I completely forgot it, so I'm glad to have the microphone again. <laughs> so the, the religion has been taken out of the schools I remember when I, when my granddaughter was at Lincoln High School, it was my daughter, not my granddaughter, it was my daughter. When my granddaughter was at Lincoln High School, they could have religion on campus after school, religious programs. Mm -hmm. Somehow I think that was cut out. I don't know if they do it anymore. I haven't heard that they do it. But I think, now we have all kinds of religions here in Dallas and across the nation. I think that children should have an opportunity to have some kind of religion if they want to in school. I think that might help those some kind of way. Maybe we used to have devotion, maybe they should have devotion. Something, because a lot of children don't have any type of moral type religion in their life. And if they don't get it at home, in the school is supposed to be an education thing. And maybe they could put that back in the school some kind of way. They wouldn't have, to, I don't think it's it would be necessary for them to teach it, but some kind of on the side moral thing for the kids to have an opportunity to express some type of moral type religious program and maybe we would have better children that would understand how to relate to each other better, how to do unto others as you would have them do unto you type of thing. Another thing that I think is important, very important, is to have some kind of curriculum for those children who will not go to college, who do not want to go to college, who want to go to work when they get out of school. I like the program that they have now where children can graduate with their associate's, associate's degree. degree. Mm -hmm. Students are prepared to go out and work with an associate's degree in some kind of field uh, that helps them get ahead in life. So there, I think there should be specific programs, though, specific in a training, plumbing, elect, a little bit electrician, uh, maybe auto mechanics, cosmetology, and other forms of education where they can be ready for work when they graduate. <coughs> Hello, my name is Brilliance Jones. Thank you all so much for being here again. Um, for those of us, I, I try.
try teaching. That was not that is not what the Lord blessed me to do at all. However, I do love and really appreciate education. I try to position myself as an advocate and an ally in education spaces, specifically for Black students. That's my passion. And so, what is the role that you would say um, is the what is the role that people who don't want to be in the classroom teaching or don't want to be in a school leading but want to be supportive of what's going on there and specifically want to be supportive of it in a way that supports the vision that the families and the students have for themselves not necessarily only what the district office or what the leaders the administrative team has that they're trying to project onto the students like what is the role that they could play or what are some ways that they could really support families um, what they're doing. so what is the role of an advocate and how are they how can they support children and families in the district without being a teacher? Yes. Okay. And in the interest of time, can we get one person to answer? Me, 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 my, me, mo. <laughs> I want to say that, um, that we need speaking from a teacher that's in there now. We need more people that are outside uh, because we have parents that won't go and fight for our children. Mm -hmm. In North Dallas, they get out and they pick it and they have. Um, um, you know, sign up sheets and everything to get things done. Well, in our area, in Pleasant Grove, our parents are, are the education is low. They're limited. You know, a lot of them are, are illegals and whatever, and they're afraid. We need people to come in and volunteer in the schools, yes. learn about the schools, and speak up for our children and for our parents and teach them how to get out and vote and make the changes that we need made for our campuses and for our schools. Thank you. Um, advocacy outside of the school system is important. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to give you two quick examples. One, when the DSEG order came down in 1974, you know, Dallas was the last mm -hmm. city in the country to desegregate its schools, the absolute last city. Mm -hmm. and that's important to know that heritage, and at yes, some point we need, we'll talk about that. But there was an organization called the um, Black Citizens to Maximize Education. Mm -hmm. All of them were outside of the district, mm -hmm. but they impacted the district by coming to school board meetings, they went and testified in the court, et cetera. So I would suggest that you find a group to get with. Recently, um, St. Luke, we have adopted several schools in South Dallas, mm -hmm. and there was an issue that came up in South Dallas where they were really, the district was really going to, excuse my wife, screw the kids mm -hmm. and the schools. Uh, we started, we, we got a telephone campaign going, called uh, the superintendent's office and the board offices. The one thing that I can take from inside, we don't like folks coming to the board meetings raising hell. <laughs> In fact, we ha that's why you have to sign up because what they will do is call you and try to resolve it before it gets there. <laughs> so when I tell you to raise your voice, do that. We change that around. The schools in South Dallas now the next three years will be reconstituted and getting everything you can think of. And that was just must call on the phone. Uh, I got a call saying, Shirley, you know, what can we do? I said, y'all better listen to those folks. Right. So they really made it. Really so, right. <laughs> so find yourself a group, or uh, form a group yeah, of exactly. advocates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and go to the school board meetings. Decide which schools or which corner of the district you want to advocate for and be there. Mm -hmm. They will tell you what they need and you be the voice for them. I mean, I can't tell you how important and what a difference that will make. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And to add to that with the group, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma <laughs> so that is, that's the beauty of it. Um, I believe that we are wrapping up. So I thank you for your time so much again. I do want to call out a few names that you all said that maybe, I don't know, what your framework is, but if you don't know these names, maybe Google it a little. There was Catherine Gillum from the school board, 1974. Dallas was the last school district to be desegregated. Um, Dr. Ottawa Friday, uh, Yvonne Yule. Is it the Southeast, Sur what is it, the Southeast Service District? Southeast Subdivision. <laughs> Lord Hammers, and I work there. East, <laughs> o, East Oak Cliff That's it, the East Oak Cliff Subdivision. Oh, so yes, we will send this all out to you teaching trust friends, but um, they're ready now. Yes, and the learning center, so so many of these things that we see as every day started here. So community liaisons, that's a community walk. The people who are now community liaisons, those are community walks. Uh, the learning centers, which is Charles, well, there's some, right? The Charles South, Ride. South Dallas and West Dallas. Yes, South Dallas and West Dallas. Paul Lawrence, Dunbar. What else are the learning centers? Uh, Martin Luther King. Uh huh. 
J.J. Rose, mm -hmm. uh, H.S. Thompson. All exemplary schools, mm -hmm. right? When I was there. When she was there. <laughs> One of her principles, right? That was always pulling my coattails too. So we will give you all this history, but it doesn't start with us, right? That's so important to know. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can keep going with the model. Jane, thank you. Yes. So um, as we close out, we wanted to make sure that uh, we also gave a token of appreciation oh um, oh, for your time, so for your service. Thank um, you. Thank you as the audience for being so attentive and yes, listening so and nobody wants to sleep, so thank you very much. Thank you.